having a little cupcake, so welcome back to Monique. If you guys are new here, then what is up? My name is Erica. Heyo, how you doing? If you're into the history of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology, and maybe, maybe you just want to finally see the suitors die in Homer's Odyssey, because like we all want that to happen, and even though that doesn't happen in this book, we like, we're all there. Well, then this is not only the video for you, this is also the channel for you. You guys are going to want to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so that you know every single time I post in the future. But on topic of today's video, and as you can see from the title, we're going to be going into the Odyssey, book 20. So if I could summarize book 20 into one sentence, it would just be that the suitors are still being assholes. Believe it or not, we are still at that point. The suitors, as I just said, do not die in this book. They are not killed in this book. We are building up to that still. So we have a lot more of the suitors just being catty. And for that purpose, I'm not going to be going into every single line that the suitors say because it is just a lot of chatter in this whole book. I will be giving you, obviously, as we do in every single episode, uh, the general outline um, in regards to the conversation and sort of the back and forth that happens um, throughout this book. However, if you need it for class or if you need it for an essay, if you need it for a course that you're doing, whatever it happens to be, I would just advise that you just you go through it yourself because it is just a lot of back and forth. It's a lot of chat. And if I am going to do every single voice and every single line, we will be here all day. But in saying that, why don't we just roll into the narrative? So where I left you in the last book, we have Odysseus who is getting ready for bed. Remember that Penelope has gone up to her bedroom and Odysseus was going to sleep on the floor because he's a beggar and he had declined the offer of, of the, the maids actually making him a bed in the palace. So he's currently on sort of all of these uh, like blankets and stuff on the floor, right? They've sort of just thrown a bunch of things on the floor. He goes to sleep on those and uh, Yurinomi comes over and throws a fleece over him so that he doesn't get cold throughout the night. Now when Yurinomi leaves, we then have all of the other maids who then walk out of the palace via the way that Odysseus is sleeping because all of them are going to go to hook up with the suitors as they do most nights. Homer does make a note of that, that like they normally leave to go and fuck the suitors. And obviously Odysseus seeing this, like they still think he's a beggar, right? But he is raging under his blanket, you guys. Like he literally has this moment where he doesn't know if he's supposed to just stand up and kill them all because he's like, you guys, you guys are such traitors. Or if he is supposed to let them go and just have like one last night with the suitors because he wants to kill them in the morning because he's had it up to his eyeballs, you guys. Like he's over this shit. But as he's lying there, he does sort of like calm himself because he reminds himself he's been in worse situations than this. He mentions the Cyclops, right, that we read the whole Polyphemus episode. He's just like, if I was calm and I stuck to a plan, then I can do it now, even though I am this close to just attacking everybody right now. So he decides to stay in bed, right? He decides to just chill out in bed, but he can't sleep because he's so like frustrated and annoyed. So he's tossing and turning all night long. Athena takes this opportunity to come down and to call him the unluckiest man alive to his face, bear in mind. Like she's just like, by the way, you should know you are super unlucky. And he's like, thanks bro. I mean, he obviously doesn't say that part, but she says that he's unlucky and, uh, and asks why he can't sleep and why he isn't resting. And he says that he's not only thinking about how he's going to kill the suitors, but he's also thinking about how he's going to avoid their avengers when he does kill them, right? Because you have to bear in mind, this is the ancient world, that sons come about and they avenge people. And, and you know, th this happens a lot, right? This happens in the book with Orestes, right? We hear this whole story about how Orestes avenged Agamemnon, right? That is, is what he's worried about. So it's a legitimate fear, to be fair to him. Athena basically tells him to calm down in this moment. She just says, you know, if there were 50 men who were mortal around Odysseus and it was just him against 50 men, he could still beat them all off and so he should be able to sleep with that knowledge and she's like I'm a goddess why wouldn't you believe me when I say that Odysseus then kind of nods and he's just like okay fair enough if this goddess is telling me that I'm a tough and that I can fight off anybody I set my mind to then I should really be able to sleep now and so Athena helps him sleep and then she off to Olympus. Unfortunately, as Odysseus falls asleep though, that's exactly when Penelope wakes up in her room, right? So she wakes up and she's just like crying, right? So she was crying in her sleep. She wakes up, she's still crying. She's like wailing. And she has this whole thing where she prays to Artemis and she wishes that Artemis would just shoot her with a bow already, which is so heartbreaking. Like I can't even tell you guys that she is wishing that she was dead. She's wishing that she couldn't feel anymore because uh, she doesn't want to feel this much pain and she doesn't want to feel this much longing. She doesn't want to feel, uh, you know, everything that she's felt over the last couple of years, couple, <laughs> the last like 20, Yes. for Odysseus in his absence. And she says that the reason why she's come to this place now is because even when she dreams, she's tormented by his, his departure and by the fact that he's not there. Like she's tortured by it even in sleep. So she can't escape from the pain whatsoever. And when dawn rises and Odysseus wakes up, he actually wakes up to the sound of Penelope wailing from upstairs and crying upstairs. Ah, 
my heart. He has to do everything. Honestly, he has to do everything in his power to not run up there and to comfort his own wife. And so instead what he does, which is great, honestly, like I read this and I'm just like, what a great way to distract yourself. That he decides he's going to fold up everything that he slept on and he's going to like top it on a chair. He's gonna like, you know, fold it all nicely and put it on a chair to try and help. And I'm like, what a hospitable man. Even by modern standards, I'm just like, yes, that is exactly what you do when you're a guest in somebody's house. So he does that, right? And, and again, I cheer for him in this moment. Odysseus then decides he's going to pray to Zeus because he doesn't actually know if he's supposed to be in the palace just yet. He doesn't know uh, what he's supposed to do. He doesn't know if he's supposed to still be, you know, walking about or like finding things out or whatever it is. So he prays to Zeus and he asks him, you know, if he's supposed to be in the position that he's in currently, if Zeus could send him a sign. And so Zeus hears the prayer, obviously. He hears the prayer and he sends out this like massive clap of thunder. And then from inside the palace, Odysseus hears this very old woman who's woken up before all of the other maids to start working. And she grinds down the grain, right? Cause somebody has to do that. She's the one who speaks the omen in this moment. And she says, well, that clap of thunder was clearly Zeus cause there ain't no cloud in the sky today. And yet all of a sudden there's thunder. It was clearly a Zeus trying to send an omen to somebody. And I just wish it was to me because I wish that the suitors will not live to see another day because I hate them. I have to wake up every morning and grind this grain for them, only for them to eat and then for them to be ungrateful and rude. And I'm sick of it. I obviously paraphrase the out of that, but that's basically the general sentiment that she wants the suitors to die and she doesn't want to have to make grain for them anymore. And so Odysseus hears this and he understands that now is his day. It's his time to shine and he's going to kill the suitors that day. After this little speech, that's when a bunch of the other maids start coming in and they start getting everything ready uh, for the day. And the narrative then snaps to Telemachus who gets up and he dresses himself and he calls Eurycleia over to his room. Now when Eurycleia comes in, he asks her, how did Odysseus sleep and how did she treat him when he left uh, to go to bed? Well, obviously not Odysseus, but the beggar. Uh, so he asks her, you know, how did you treat the man and all of this? And uh, Eurycleia says, well, we did want to make him a bed. However, we offered it to him and he declined it. And so he slept on the floor on a bunch of, of you know, covers and shit like that because that's what he wanted, not out of our choice. This pleases Telemachus. And so he just then takes up his spear and he walks down to the hall. And actually as he's walking down to the hall, we then get an image of uh, his two hounds that are like trotting behind him at his heels. So he's got this really powerful move where he's walking down to the hall and these dogs are coming, not flanking him, they're behind him, right? But it's still a powerful image as he enters uh, the hall and Eurycleia goes down with him, but she stops by uh, the women, by the serving women, to give them orders for the day and very long speech short. She just says, look alive guys, we've got things to be doing. She orders them to do a bunch of things and we get this in detail. And so then they all scatter to their various jobs. So if you need to know what the serving women do, which I don't know why you would, you can go and check that in the text. It will just, it will literally be far too long if I sit here and go, this person did this and, and however many people did this. There's a lot of that is detailed, a lot of household chores, which even as you're reading it, you're just like, uh, okay, that's enough. As that's all going on, we then have Eumaeus who shows back up at the palace, right? And he brings uh, three of his like fattest pigs, right? Because he's the swineherd, that is Eumaeus's job. So he shows up and uh, at the porch, he sort of ties them all, all to the, the porch thing. There's like a railing, right? And he ties all of the pigs up there and he walks over to a decent disguise and he asks him if uh, if the suitors were more, more respectful to him, by the time Eumaeus left or after Eumaeus left uh, the palace and Odysseus basically just says, no, they're really rude and they, <laughs> they didn't lighten up at all when you left. And as they're talking, we then have the goat herd that shows up, right? And he brings a bunch of his goats. He ties them up on the porch again near the pigs and he walks over to uh, to the swine herd Eumaeus and to Odysseus in disguise. And he just looks at Odysseus in disguise and he's just like, still alive, are we? And he literally says that Odysseus in disguise should leave. Otherwise he's going to meet uh, uh, Melanthius's fist that he, he basically just challenges him to a fight. He's just like, I will fight you if you don't leave at this point. Blah, blah, blah. And Odysseus in disguise like doesn't even bite. He doesn't take the bait. He's just like, this guy internally, obviously not outside, but internally he just wants him to shut up. It doesn't give him the time of day. Now we have a new addition into the whole animal herding crowd here, right? So again, I'm just gonna stress, we have the swine herd here. We have the goat herd here and we have a decent disguise who's a beggar. And then through the door walks the cow herd. I'm not going to say his name one because I can't pronounce it because I can't remember it for the life of me, but I also will not ever need it. You will never need it. So I'm just gonna call him the cow herd. So we've got the, the pig guy, the cow guy and the goat guy all talking to a beggar who's actually the king. It's kind of funny. I just like it. We get this like little, little sort of posse of, of animal herders in this book that all hate each other, but also talk to each other. It's very strange. Maybe that was like a normal dynamic between different types of animal herders in ancient Greece, but whatever, not the point of this. So the cow herd comes, he shows up with a heifer because remember all of this is food for the suitors. He shows up with a heifer, ties it to the Porsche, puts the Porsche, 
Not the car, the porch. <laughs> he ties it to the porch though, uh, alongside the pig and the goats and everything. And he walks over to Eumaeus and he asks, you know, how everything was and all this and, and who the stranger is, who Odysseus in disguise is. And Eumaeus then replies and he sort of introduces himself kind of, well, introduces Odysseus in disguise to the cow herd. And the cow herd goes on this very long tangent. I won't lie to you. And <laughs> a lot of it, I'm just gonna summarize it for you. It's basically him just showing his loyalty towards the King Odysseus. And he goes in this long spiel of how he's still holding out hope for Odysseus to come home because he loves his king and he loves, um, you know, his, his his ruler and all of this and how he's still really loyal to him and how he had been flip-flopping over the years that Odysseus was not there. He'd been flip-flopping of whether he should go to another island to tend to another guy's cattle or if he should stay on Ithaca. But the issue with him staying on Ithaca that he doesn't like, and he does stress this, is that he is now raising cattle. He raises these great cattle, by the way. He even says that like, hello, you ain't seen no prettier cattle than the ones that I raise, even though they are only just eating corn. Like I'm just that good at my job. But these great cattle are not being eaten by the person who owns them. And that is his struggle, that he wants to serve somebody who's actually going to enjoy uh, his own, you know, the things that he's he's growing and growing the cattle. <laughs> but you know, the things that he has paid for basically is what, what he's saying. And that's the general gist of the speech. He believes in Odysseus, he's loyal to Odysseus, he doesn't know if he's still alive or not, and he wants him to eat the cattle that he's taking so long to race. And obviously he ends with, if only Odysseus were back to drive away the suitors. And Odysseus in disguise cuts in, he's obviously, you know, he loves, loves everything the cowherd just says. And he sort of cuts in to just be like, you know, I'm swearing a solemn oath right now that Odysseus will be home soon and he'll be home this month because he's on his way and he's on a neighboring island Blah, blah, blah. All the stuff that we've heard before, he relays again to the cowherd, and the cowherd replies and says, Oh, if only that were true, if only Zeus could grant us this. And he does stress that if Odysseus was back to take on the suitors, that he would stand by Odysseus in order to do that. And then Eumaeus in this moment sort of echoes that, that sentiment. Uh, as well. As this weird little conversation is happening between all the herders, bear in mind Melanthius, the, the goat herd, is still standing there, right? Like he just hasn't said anything in a while, but he's still there. As this is going on, all the suitors are still trying to plot Telemachus's death. Obviously, they have literally nothing else better to do because Penelope won't give them the time of day. And so they're just like, it, we're still gonna kill the prince. We've tried before, we failed, but we're still gonna do it. So they've all met to discuss the death of Telemachus. And as they're doing this, uh, they, they get an omen. Obviously, there are lots of omens in this book. The omen is of this eagle, right? And it's clutching this dove. And so Amphinomus, who we like, he looks up at that and he just says, well, I'm gonna read that. And what it says to me, what the gods are calling down to me to say to you guys is that, yeah, we're not gonna succeed with this. Like, look, that's, it's not gonna happen. That's what that eagle means. And so therefore we should just go into the palace and we should just eat. Which surprisingly, all of the other suitors like the sound of. Like, I think all of them are hitting a point where they just think us plotting the prince's death is stupid. And Finimus then just says, it's not going to work. All of them wanted to say that. And so they're like, great, I'm starving, let's go eat. And so they all go in, they take their seats in the palace. We have Eumaeus who walks around with cups for everybody, like, like goblets for everybody. We then have the cow herd who walks around with loaves of bread. And then we have the goat herd who then is the one that's pouring out the wine for all of them into the cup. So all the men, you know, they're doing their best and they are helping out around the house and we love it. Telemachus then sets up his seat for uh, for the feast and he then has another seat sat next to him for Odysseus in disguise. He sets up another table for him because he's still a beggar so he can't sit like, at, like especially he can't sit at, at uh, Telemachus's table even. So he can't sit there but he sits at, at his own table, he has his own chair and Telemachus just sort of leans over and is like don't worry like I'm, I'm gonna defend you from all of these insults if they hurl at you, if they try to taunt you, like don't even worry. And what he's saying is he's saying it loud enough for all of the suitors to hear, right? So it's not a quiet word between son and, and father. It's a more of a public show on Telemachus' part that he says this is now his house, that Odysseus won, his dad, won the house uh, for him. And now it's his because Odysseus is not home. And so therefore he, you know, he sees everything under this roof. And he says that I will 100% back you up if any of these idiots decide that they're going to be rude to you. All the suitors listening to this bite their tongues because they are quite shocked that Telemachus can speak one so confidently and one so powerfully. And it's actually Antinous. Or, by the way, when I was reading it, I don't know why I thought this, but like literally two days ago when I was finishing up all of this reading, I was like, is it Antinous? Is that how you would pronounce that? A Greek person, help me. I've committed to Antinous though, so I'm not changing it, but it just occurred to me that it could definitely be pronounced differently. So he gets up though, right? The Head, the one that we don't like, he stands up. And he just gets up to taunt Telemachus and he just says that he's got all these empty threats and that none of them mean anything. And Zeus knows it to be true and whatever. And again, he's just being 
for no reason. And Telemachus actually doesn't even bite back in this moment. Like he doesn't even say a word. He doesn't give Antonus the time of day whatsoever. Instead, Telemachus just basically says that Odysseus is gonna get his fair cut of meat and his fair cut of uh, food because he's there and he has decided that's what's gonna happen even though he is a beggar or at least appears to be a beggar. But Athena decides that the suitors are going to stir today because again, as I have been saying for the last couple of books, we gotta push Odysseus to want to kill all of them. And more importantly, we have to push the reader <laughs> to, as we're reading this, want Odysseus to kill more than 100 people in one go, right? That's a very big thing he has to do. We need to hate every single one of them. So Athena steps in right now to make us hate them. She decides to target this person. I'm not going to say his name because again, that CT sound, I genuinely have no idea how to pronounce that. A Greek person, let me know, is it, is one of those letters silent? I've asked this before, but nobody helped me that time. So <laughs> please help me out for pronunciation in the comments. This guy is the one who is egged on by uh, Athena in this moment though. He says that Odysseus in disguise, that as a beggar, he's gotten more than his fair share of coming into the palace, getting a place to sleep, getting all of his food and all of this. And he says, because you've had your fair share, I too want to give you a gift. And what the f does this man do? He picks up an ox hoof, I kid you not, picks up an ox hoof and lobs it at Odysseus, which lucky, lucky for him, he ducks, right? He ducks and the ox hoof hits the wall behind him. But you were genuinely reading this going, one, where the f did the ox hoof come from? Like what? Why is that just lying about? And two, why would you throw it at someone? I know that Athena just made him do it. But also I was like, Jesus, man, you could have probably killed him or at least give him a concussion. Odysseus doesn't say anything though. And it's actually Telemachus who stands up right now. And he basically says to this guy, he says, look, you are lucky and you should bless your stars right now and thank your stars right now that you did not hit this beggar in my house because if you did I would have rammed my spear into your abdomen. He then makes a more general speech to all of the suitors saying that the boy that they once knew when they arrived to the palace is no longer who is sitting in Telemachus' seat, that he's now a man and he's taking charge and he's not putting up with their bullshit any longer, which thank God. He also says that they should feel much more shame than they do because they've been nothing but rude since they came to the palace. Not only are they eating all the food, not only are they taking up like literal space in, in the palace, which nobody invited them into, bear in mind, they just saw the space and they went, I'ma take that. So Telemachus is like, that also sucks. And then lastly, he says that they should feel more shame for the fact that they come in and they take all of the serving women uh, to, to ravish them, shall we say, right? And he says, you guys have no shame for that. And the suitors, unsurprisingly, have nothing to say to this. They have absolutely nothing to say in retaliation to Telemachus because everything that he just said was pretty much true. Aside from one guy, one asshole who stands up, his name is Agalaeus. Right? It's felt like this. Agalaeus stands up. He does start the speech well though. I will give it to him that he starts off by saying that Telemachus speaks uh, very strongly. And so because of that, they shouldn't be hurling anything back at him. They shouldn't be rude back to him because he is a prince and he's speaking with power and they should respect that. However, he is sitting there and he is wishing for Odysseus to come back, but it's clear that he's not coming back, right? It's been more than enough time. And he says this, he says, you have been waiting for such a long time for your father to return and for your mother has now been unmarried. This is getting ridiculous. What you should be convincing her if you are so much of a man, you should be convincing her to marry the best option out of all of us and encouraging her to leave the palace to start her new life. Telemachus there replies and he says, actually, I have been encouraging my mother to remarry. Let's start there. But also I will not encourage her to leave a palace that she doesn't want to do. He says those are two totally different things that one is telling her to remarry to start a new marriage and the other one is telling her to leave her home. Like absolutely not. She should get married. She doesn't have to leave her home if she doesn't want to though. When I read that the first time even when I was younger, I was just like, that's how it's done Telemachus. Yes, you encourage her in the way that you know the society, remember we have to bear in mind this is a different society. He's doing the right thing by encouraging her to take another husband because otherwise she's literally going to just waste away, right? <laughs> she's a queen and nobody's really listened to her anyways. She's kind of getting walked all over. So she does need a husband in those terms times, but he's like, she doesn't have to leave her home. Like the guy can come here. And I'm like, yes, obsessed. This end little section of the book is a lot of just the suitors laughing at Telemachus and laughing at other people in the hall without really there being anything of, of substance there to describe in this video. It's just a lot of them lobbing abuse, for lack of a better word, at Telemachus. Telemachus not really biting back and, and that's sort of the whole conversation. It's not really, like there's nothing momentous that's said here. There's nothing that's really important that really triggers anybody to do anything. So I'm not gonna be getting into it, but there is a big sort of, you know, they're all sort of laughing at him and, and it's not very nice. Let's just say that. Actually, little side note, um, that Theo does pop up in this moment. I was thinking about not including this in the episode, but now I think I will, that he pops up in this moment and he has this little like one liner where he talks about how he can see the ghosts of the suit is walking before him. And that's one thing that makes the suitors laugh, right? So that's something that they think is quite funny, um, which obviously is not funny because he's telling them you're going to 
can die, but they don't listen to him. And yeah. What is important is that the book ends with Homer telling us that as this has all been happening, Penelope has come down to the hall and she's pulled up a chair close enough to all of the men so that she could hear what they're saying. And it's Homer who lets us know that Penelope is now listening to this. She's in the know of how rude the suitors are. She knows it's her time to start testing the suitors, as she said to Odysseus in disguise uh, the pre in the previous book anyways. She said that to him. She knows now it's her time. And uh, so now we've sort of set that in motion that all of this is now going to come to a lovely bitter end. That is the end of the book. So thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode. Nothing really happens again. That was just like a big conversational book. The next one we're gonna have start to have some action at least thank f because there has not been a lot for me to even act out in these last books but we will be getting to some action we'll finally be seeing the suitors die at some point i am ready for it but yeah thanks again and we'll be seeing you next time with book 21 of homer's odyssey so we'll see you then